Ladies and gentlemen, we now direct your attention to Commissioner Kuhn's box situated at the home plate side of the Reds dugout where the ceremonial first pitch will be thrown out by the widow of the inspirational leader of the 1961 National League champion Cincinnati Reds, Mrs. Fred Hutchinson. Patsy Hutchinson will throw out the first ball. What a lovely lady. Johnny Bench will take one more. Baseball certainly remains a big part of the Hutchinson family. Jack, the second of the three sons and one daughter, one time played in the Red System, is now the assistant director of stadium operations for the Brewers. Rick, the oldest son, a former player at Florida State. Another, right behind him, one of the Hutchinson boys. Chubb Feeney next to Patsy. Doesn't seem possible that Fred has been gone since November 12, 1964, but certainly memorialized with the Cancer Research Center in Seattle. There go the Reds. Tony, it's amazing when you look at this field, and Marty, you've seen it so often. The rain came down, that big uh, squeegee comes out, and look how dry it is. It's Italian. You should have pronounced it. What is it called? A Zamboni? <laughs> Zamboni machine. And, uh, <laughs> Joe, you and I were talking before the broadcast tonight that they have never had an official game rained out here. They had a second game of a doubleheader a few years back. They had a game stopped at the end of five innings last year, a tie game with Atlanta, but never an official date rained out since they moved in here in 1970. Fred Norman, a little guy who was used in middle relief, he and Belly Billingham kind of swapped positions. He's digging it out there, boy. Get him a rake and a shovel. Tony, I know that Larry Shepard, the pitching coach, you were there visiting with him. And looks like before he starts, he's going to be like the doctor. He's going to have everything ready. You talk to Larry Shepard about Fred Norman. Right, I asked Larry about his pitching style. He's been very consistent for the Reds. We talked to him before the ball game, and here's their pitching coach, Larry Shepard. Well, uh, he has all the pitches, Tony. I think that uh, with the curveball, the screwball, the fastball, the straight change, uh, plus the fact that he has control of all his pitches, and uh, I think this is going to give them trouble. I don't know about you, Tony, but my favorite shot of this four is the one in the upper right-hand corner because I like to know what that pitcher's looking at when he starts to throw. And Norman, like a lot of them, and this shot proves it, they look down at the ground. Watch when he delivers. No, well, he was looking straight ahead that time. Time before he did. That'd make me feel better as a hitter, wouldn't you? <laughs> they say he has a little bit of a problem uh, when he tries to nibble too much. If he tries to be too cute, tries to nibble on the corners, he can get behind. We heard Larry Shepard talk about his screwball, slow curve. And I think his fastball is more deceptive sometimes, Marty, than people give him credit for. It is, Tony, because of his off-speed pitches. You mentioned his screwball and his, his curveball, and, and when he gets those pitches over and they're working effectively for him, it does. his fastball is deceptively quick. Would you expect a lot of ground balls if he's got his good stuff? Absolutely, uh, Joe. And uh, Tony mentioned the fact that he has been guilty many times this season of nibbling. And it's a tremendous problem for Freddie. He can roll along maybe giving up two, three hits over maybe a six-inning span and all of a sudden completely lose it because I know as Sparky comments, he's thinking too much out there. <laughs> Don't want you to think, want you to throw. And there's his 1975 statistics in his lifetime, 52 and 57. Fred Norman has bounced around, but here he is in the major leagues. 15th pro season, here is Juan Beniquez, who is known as a fastball first ball hitter. You might say that about most of these Red Sox. An aggressive club. Takes it high, ball one. Manager Daryl Johnson made a change in his lineup with Beniquez in left field and Yastrzemski at first base. Two balls and no strikes. Norman falls behind hitters, and that'll get you in trouble. Wants a new baseball. I love that. Now, the umpire put it in his pocket. Two pitches later, going to give him the same ball. It's going to be all right. Ah, the pitchers tell me they can tell. That little seam is out of place. Oh, sure. They tell me that, too. <laughs> you believe them? I believe you. <laughs> You're sitting right next to me. They're not. <laughs> Straight away center field. Geronimo has plenty of room. 
One away, and it brings up Denny Doyle. Joe and Marty, you've got to wonder uh, what kind of attitude the Red Sox are going into this after they lost two consecutive games, both of which they might have won. A little bit base running that may have been a little bit too risky. Well, I'll tell you, Johnny Bench wasn't that happy about the victory. He was a little bit upset last night. He said, we were lucky to win it, very lucky to win it. He said, we uh, made some bad plays, and I hope it woke us up. Hits his bat at strike one. 2-2 Two -two pitch. Morgan. Two outs. I like the way he shakes off a pitch. He really sneers it off. You know, he gives you that tough upper lip. He sneers at you. Be surprised how many funny faces pitchers make. And sometimes you're down in the crotch. I used to have to laugh sometimes. They just give you, they don't mean it, you know, but they just bearing down so much. I guess their expression depends a lot upon whom they've got to look in at. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. You really did, Tony. Here's your Stremski. Two for 11 in this series. Takes a fastball high. Boy, he was out there mighty early. Bus got out there about 5 o'clock. He had taken a cab an hour or so earlier. Hit it to right field. It's a base hit. Got a curveball up, and he just kind of stroked it oh so gently. Yastrzemski is on. And that brings up Carlton Fisk. Well, I'll tell you, if I'd have been catching, I believe I'd have made the same kind of a beef. Because I, I only changed my mind after watching the replay about 18 times a day. Not too bad. I thought it'd be worse than it is, Marty. These fans didn't give it to him too badly. No, they really didn't, Joe, and it was somewhat surprising. But I guess the biggest reason was the fact that uh, it was a play that had the Reds ultimately coming out on top in the ball game. But he really put up quite a storm at home plate. Carlton Fisk. There's the strike. He's two for nine. One home run, three runs batted in. He's been a good hitter for the Red Sox in this series. He got it going last night. Tremendous home run. One and one. Mrs. Fisk. She just keeps up that applause. <laughs> Ah, the lonely life of the pretty wives. Come on, Pudge. Curveball is the beauty. He dropped the curveball, and they're off speed. And there is Larry Barnett, who was involved in the play last night. He's along the right field line. He was behind the plate last night. Out on strike. This on a screwball. So the Red Sox do not score in the top of the first. We go to the bottom half. No score. And there he is, Luis Tiant. And Mrs. Tiant. What in the world is that? <laughs> <laughs> Man, she came prepared, didn't she? <laughs> Beautiful. Fans are going to have some fun watching Louis pitch here tonight. Oh, I tell you, he is something to watch. We warn you ahead. There'll be nothing wrong with your fine tuning knob. He'll be out of focus. <laughs> Here he comes. Fastball is a strike. You remember he threw a slow curveball to Pete Rose that had him kind of talking to himself. Makes you wonder if he'll be up there looking for it. Three for 12 in the series. No score. One and one. Rose hit the ball hard off him up in Boston. He had three balls on the nose. There's that slow oh, curve. He's waiting for it. He too. was waiting for it. Yes, sir. And still couldn't oh, do much with it. <laughs> he's talking to himself. Joe, you talk about Tiant's motion in relation to Pete. Tony made the comment about the three hard hit balls. Pete said that Louis Tiant's head could roll off toward the first base foul line as he delivered to the plate. He wouldn't even notice it. Say he is something. One two pitch. Fastball, and he had to fight it off. Outside, two and two. Ball three, breaking ball. Three balls, two strikes. 
Tian has been outstanding in five of his last six starts. His last six starts, he's allowed five earned runs in 48 and two thirds inning. That's an earned run average of 0 0.92. Amazing. Payoff pitch. Pretty good fastball. He's going to need it tonight. He usually has pretty good control, too. He can spot the ball with all of his pitches. He walks two or three a game. Look at those statistics, Tony. 27 hits, six runs, five runs, three shutouts. Boy, look at that bottom line. Oh, what they pay off on. Up the middle, it's a base hit. Tian, because of his follow through, was not ready and it got through there. This telecast is presented by Authority of Major League Baseball, is intended solely for the private, non commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or the use of the pictures, descriptions, and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. Major League Baseball has the right of approval of the announcers for this event. Joe, you might take a close look at Pete Rose here as Ken Griffey steps in. Sparky Anderson made the comment earlier tonight that something may be going if he gets on initially. Well, he's on. Not too big a lead. There he goes. Left center field. That's going to block the gap. Rose will score easily. Here he comes. There goes Griffey the third. They're going to have a shot at him. In time, they got him. Once again, the Boston Red Sox with fundamentally sound basic baseball. Hitting the cutoff man who got the ball in good shape. Fine relay throw as we look at Lynn all the way over left center to Rick Burleson, the cutoff man. Look at Art France, the third base umpire. He's eating dust right along with Petroselli and Griffey. Good relay. Great execution, Joe. The Red Sox, hoping to even the series, named Luis Tiant to come back in game four. But Tiant, who shut out the Reds in the first game, has problems right away. Pete Rose leads it off. Single to center field. Griffey hits the next pitch to left center field. It's a double. Scoring row. Griffey was out trying to stretch it to a triple. That was just perfect, boy. That's page 10 of the Spalding Guide if you want to know how you make relay plays. Lynn gave it to Burleson. Burleson a one hopper, which is an easy ball for the infield and the handle. And Bongo, they got the man. Pete Rose scores. It's one nothing. Here is Joe Morgan. Hit and run play. Marty, you hit it right on the head. You said something would happen. It didn't take long. Ball one. <laughs> Wrinkle those socks. Two balls, no strikes. All three. Three nothing pitch. Strike is called. Burleson, the shortstop, really over towards the back. A lot of room between Burleson and Petroselli. Look at that. Man, he drive two, three. Whew. Now we'll see it. What do you think, Tony? Well, let's hear what Joe Morgan says. We uh, had a little audio tape or videotape with him before the game. We asked him what about Luis Tion's move. Let's hear what. Little Joe's got to say about Luis Tian. What will you do about it? Well, Tony, Louis has a quick move at first, which is a legitimate move, and he also has a balk move at first. And he interchanges the two, and I think it throws the umpires off a little bit. His balk move, he starts his throw to first base without stepping, and on his regular move, he does step. What a lead Joe's got. He's got a big lead as Perez waits. They throw oh. it back. He just made it, dropped the ball. You can tell the big lead because Morgan can get at least one foot on the artificial surface. That's the yardstick. Pete Rose, when he broke, did not have, he was in the dirt area. But watch Morgan. If you can get to the artificial surface, you got yourself a good lead. There he goes measuring again. 
back there. He, he read that pretty good. That wasn't as close. Morgan's come out and said that he's not going to be thrown out anymore the rest of this series. Man, we got some battle going here now. Say what you want, and Perez has to wait. Morgan continues to defy Tian by getting a big lead. Tian challenging him. Cat and mouse. Holding. Foul back. Pitch out. Nothing happening. Morgan says he loves it. He said he can read pitch outs. That man goes quicker to hold. That's all he needs. He does. He stops his tracks. Doesn't even break. He didn't break at all. But look out now. Holding. Bouncing ball. Burleson's only play at first base. In time. Nice play by Yastrzemski at first base. George Maloney, the umpire. A double call to make sure that everybody knew he was out. Burleson made a good play on that ball. He did. Throwing off balance. Couldn't get much on it as he was going a little bit away from first base. Johnny Bench with the score one nothing Cincinnati. Single by Rose, double by Griffey, and that snapped Tian's streak of no earned runs in his last 27 innings. Johnny Bench, 3 for 12 in the World Series. They won't give him too much to hit with first base open. High ball one. The on deck batter is George Foster, a good hitter, but not the threat to hit one out of here that Johnny Bench is. There you see Foster. One and one. Perez and Bench have had a couple of pretty good swings, just missing. That's been said a lot in this game, hasn't he? Just missed it. High fastball. Got to believe John widened his strike zone, tried to drive that run, and that was not a good strike. It was a good pitch by Tian. Marty, how much did that shoulder injury bother Johnny Bench during the course of the year? Tony, it bothered him a lot more than he let people think it did. Uh, actually, at one point, it got so bad that he had to go to Sparky Anderson and said, look, I've got to sit down for a while and give it rest. He had a number of shots to try to alleviate the problem. One, two pitch. All right. Two and two, two outs, one run in. We're in the bottom of the first. Tian hasn't given that whirling dervish kind of move where he kicks his leg at base runner Morgan at second base. But do for it. Way back there, right center field, slow curveball, and it drops for the extra base. Morgan scores easily. Bench has a double. That ball seemed to hang up there a long time. And Evans and Lim gave it a chase. Couldn't seem to catch up with it. Two nothing Cincinnati. Valley said up in Fenway that they wouldn't be able to play as shallow as Mr. and Mrs. Johnny Bench in the stands. Here's Freddie Lynn. He and Evans have not moved back too much since coming over from Fenway, but they got hurt by Pete Rose yesterday. This ball hung up as you said, Joe, but they were playing relatively shallow. Couldn't get to it. Here is George Foster now. Two nothing ball game. Cincinnati out in front. Hot smash to Petroselli, but he was right there guarding the line. And Stremski, nice play, almost pulled him off the bag. At the end of an inning, Cincinnati two, Boston nothing. Bench lines one between Evans and Lynn, a two base hit, and it scores Morgan with the second run. Two to nothing, Cincinnati. Split screen as we see Sparky Anderson on the left, Daryl Johnson on your right. Sparky's very superstitious. He always has Alex Grammas to his right when the opposition is batting. To his left, I'm sure, is George Sugar. Daryl Johnson is kind of sitting there. Two contrasting personalities managing these teams. Sparky's bubbling all the time, willing to talk to anybody, and Daryl Johnson not rude, but he's been kind of short with his answers. Simple yeses and noes. 
Although I guess you said more than yes or no yesterday in that 10th inning. <laughs> I kind of think he did, Tony. Here's Fred Lynn, 3 for 11 in the series. Against Fred Norman, Red Sox trail 2 nothing, top of the second. Ball one. Lynn trying to draw Pete Rose in. Petroselli, who has really been a hot hitter. Petroselli, six base hits. Petroselli and Burleson tied for the Red Sox lead in hits. There's a strike. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. 1-1 one, one pitch. Look at that bench. He scooped that up like picking cherries. Watch, watch him just grab that ball like it's a tweezer, a giant tweezer. Hello there. He's got a magnet in that glove, Tony. Isn't that something? When a catcher does that, the pitcher never looks wild. Down the left field line, maybe playable. It's near the stands and into the stands. You know, some catchers will make a pitcher look wild. They're jumping around and moving. Bench. Nobody That's ever looks wild. He's the kind of guy you want to say, well, he can do it all. And then you say, well, he, he doesn't run too well. But then you look at what he's done, 12 of 12. He's an excellent base runner. High curveball. He chased it, missed it, strike three. And that's the second strikeout for Norman, two in a row. Rico Petroselli. Petroselli is six for 11. Three runs batted in. That's a broken bat, base hit for Petroselli. And in my book, there's no such thing as a cheap hit. They're all too tough to get. And Petroselli now has his seventh base hit of the World Series. Might have been a screwball that Rico got off the end of the bat. Looked like pretty good location. That's the pitch that used to get Rico out very easily when he was a big slugger. Kept the ball away. Now he goes the opposite way at times with that pitch. He did hit that ball right on the end of the bat. You could see it. Here is Dwight Evans, who was a hero for a couple of minutes last night. Hit a big home run to tie it up. Fred Norman expected to be utilized as a reliever in the series, but he has not thrown tonight. Here's a fly ball hit into left field. Foster back on the warning track, and he will not get it. It's a home run and a tie ball game. Bouncing ball to Concepcion to Morgan. One, that's all they're going to get. Evans can run. Two outs. And Rick Burleson is a batter. Joe, I think uh, what tells a little bit of the story of the kind of competitor that Freddie Norman is, he was peeved when he was passed up for the second game up in Boston. I know a lot of left-handed pitchers uh, want to pass up Fenway Park, Boston. Yeah, that's one of those parks that left-handers get bad backs, isn't it? Ooh. Ten hits and 20 times at bat. That's pretty good in the postseason play uh, games. Burleson, first pitch once again. This time it's Rose who comes over and makes the play. Going to say Concepcion, but Pete Rose covered a lot of ground. Ends the inning. We go to the bottom of here it comes. We talked about on a play made this way yesterday going to his left. He considers this his best play. What an adjustment he's had to make and do it well and never lost his hitting either. So it's 2 nothing as we go in the bottom half of the second inning. Cincinnati in front. Dave Concepcion leads it off against Luis Tian. That was a tough first inning for Tian. Made 28 pitches at the plate. Three more pitches at first base when Morgan was on. That's a lot of pitches for him. Fastball is a strike. Concepcion had some problems with Tian in Boston. But then who didn't? He won that game 6-0. Strike two. Hot smash to Petroselli. Played him perfectly. One up, one down. Petroselli has been as steady a ball player as you want. He's hitting, he's fielding, getting on base, and just kind of doing it in a quiet, positive way. Still insists he might quit and call this his last year. Boy, you would hate to see that happen with the kind of a series he's having. Here's Geronimo, a two for eight, hit a big home run last night. Fastball misses. Another one of those oddities in this series. A small ballpark, two games, no home runs. Last night they were flying out of here, six of them. Big ballpark. There's that slow curve, hit off the end of the bat. Doyle. So Geronimo is out. 
What would you do, Tony, if you were batting against a guy like Tian as you watch him? I think I might do what Cincinnati's trying to do. They're taking the fastball and going after the off-speed spin. Look at Louie, another change-up curveball. Geronimo was looking for an off-speed pitch, but he still hit it on the end of the bat. That pitch, he seemed to sling it. One of those frozen shoulder jobs. Of course, he looked seven different directions before he threw it, too, which can be a little distracting. Here is Norman, not a bad hitter. Louis tells a great story on his dad, the former great left handed Cuban pitcher. There's Rose pitching in the polo grounds. And he apparently had a great fastball and also a great move to first base. And he threw over to first base. The hitter swung and missed, threw his bat down in disgust, told the umpire, I never saw the ball. And then, now listen to this, how's this for a ball man. player's excuse? He reconsidered and said, I thought I got a piece of it. <laughs> Deion plays, it's a true story. He threw the first, the, the guy swung, swung, and went back to the bench and said, Louis, I thought I got a piece of it. He said, I got a piece of it. Louis claims it's true. Left field. Venikas is where he makes the play. I'm going to have to ask Satchel Page about that. That sounds like his kind of story. So at the end of two, Cincinnati two, Boston nothing. We'll be back here for game number five tomorrow night of the 1975 World Series. Joe Garagiola's baseball world will be on, and you've got Max Patkin. He's Max been in Patkin. every park in the world. That's right. You know, he's the last of his breed, which it all began, at least in my memory, with Al Shack as the clown prince and Max, it was a very physical show. We went to Rochester, filmed him, and I think you'll enjoy it. I don't think there's going to be any more after Max. Here is Tian to lead it off. We're in the third inning. Curveball, and they're treating him with respect, and they should because it was Tian as Benikas swings that bat in the on deck circle. Tian got himself a base hit when he were at Fenway. Ball two. And he almost missed. He did miss home plate as he came around and he went back and tagged it. Ball three. I tell you, it's easy to see why they would love this fella, especially in Boston. You've got to like him. He's a bear down guy, gives you everything he's got. 3 0 pitch. Ball four draws the walk. And that'll send Sparky Anderson to the water cooler, I guarantee you. That'll make you stir at least. Hiroshi used to always go to water cooler. There he is. There's his uh, superstitious lineup. Graham is to his right. That's Sparky Anderson with his leg crossed, which is another one of his superstitions. Sharger, the coach, has to sit up there off his left shoulder, and Larry Shepard to the right of Grammis. Sure has worked. <laughs> it sure has, especially <laughs> if you've got good hitters. There is Norman sneering off a pitch, and Benicus hasn't taken his eyes off him. Look at the concentration on Benicus. Screwball. Let's see if their eyes meet. I mean by that, after he gets the sign, if Benicus will pick him up right away, Tony. He's got it. Another one, same pitch. Two strikes. Off the end of the bat, but it's going to sneak through. Whoa, Louis. Tian, <laughs> he made that <laughs> left turn. <laughs> Louis had some experience this year being on base. That was the first game of the World Series. Almost gets nipped by the ball. <laughs> You're going in the right direction, Louis. Don't round it too far at second. Tell you the other day in Boston we got on first. They gave him a jacket and a road map. Now he's looking like he's gonna got some ideas. <laughs> Throw a lasso on him. That's it. He's just one of those guys that makes things happen when he's around him. As the base hit to right field almost hits him. He Tion. scores. Yeah. Ball misses home plate. Something's always happening. He's an exciting kind of guy. So it's first and second. Now here's Denny Doyle. Doyle bounced out his first time up, and they're moving in on him. At first and third, they're looking for the bunt. 
He squares around and then whoops, look out there. The Cincinnati infield was doing a little decoy in there too. They were creeping in at the corners and Concepcion was way over toward the back. That's where he was now. But as soon as Norman started pitching, they backed up on the left side a little bit. Remember it was Doyle who slapped the ball by Rose in one of the ball games earlier. He's got a lot of room between Concepcion and Rose. Ball one to count. Center field, Geronimo covering over fast and makes the play. The ball was well hit, but he was very shallow. He covered a lot of ground. The kind of situation you would expect Doyle to bunt, Joe. I thought he was going to bunt all the way, but they put so much pressure at the corners on this artificial surface, didn't feel he could do it successfully. Johnson, one of those uh, managers who plays pretty conservative, but again, that uh, pressure from Rose and Perez just took the butt right away from him. So I haven't seen that conservative play by Johnson. I think he's really well, he had his guys going uh, on the base pass. Yeah. The only guy he really didn't bunt with, we expected, was Yaz, and he said he would have bunted with him last night if he'd got one strike. Oh, he's not conservative on the bases at all. R three and O. Oh. Bouncing ball to Morgan. There's one. And there's two double play four six three. And the crowd loves it. Here's the play once again. Two nothing Cincinnati leading. Tony here's that double play again. You got to love the way Morgan gives you that ball. You see right here why David Concepcion's son's middle name is Alexander after Alex Kramis who spent so much time working on him with just that specific play among many others. A lot of hours put in trying to refine his double play technique. Certainly has refined it to the point that he's got it down perfectly. Here is Rose. He single and scored the first run. Single to center field. Hit hard center field. Lynn is there. Boy, he jumped on the first pitch and really drilled it. Can't say fool him with that one. Here is Griffey. He's up to now with a 1 1 count. What a pitch that was. I got a question for you, Joe. All right. If you had had Griffey's speed as a player, what might you have done? <laughs> probably an artificial <laughs> surface, too. Oh, that, too. You have probably, it all. I probably did a hard 260. That way, Parks wall in right field for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the one two pitch. A hard 260. A hard 260. <laughs> What's Any, a hard 260? <laughs> anything I hit's hard, man. <laughs> two balls and two strikes on Griffey. In addition to not being able to hit, I also couldn't run. <laughs> right back to Tian. He's got this one. And over to first. You had a hard four base hits one World Series. Don't discount that. Uh, you can catch lightning in a bottle once in a while, Tony. Here is Morgan. Here's a shot from behind. The pitcher, here's what it's going to look like the outfield. You know, Tony, it's a funny thing as a, as a catcher, all the years you spend with the ball coming towards you but the infield is an outfield is it's going away from you you know what I'm saying makes a lot of sense so far I know but I mean it's a different perspective like when you sit in a ballpark like right now this is where the infielder would see it right yeah I mean a catcher's view it's always going to come to him so it's it, you're not leaning forward I know. It's the same thing with adding <laughs> with the catches. That theory you got get it, man. Pop, pop. I can see that blank look. It's like it's a look you get when you start to blow up the footballs. I know. <laughs> that ball's well hit. But you uh Finikas is out there this time and makes the play. So you see Yastrzemski, he had it covered well. Three up and three down. It's two nothing, Cincinnati. Norman against Carlton Fisk. It would be easy to say right now, Joe, that Boston is down, but it's the World Series, and I know they're not. They know what they've been through this entire year with Baltimore in pursuit. Well hit in the gap, left center field. Could be extra base, but look at Geronimo get over there and cut that ball off. Fine defensive play, and there's that raw speed Plucky was talking about. 
I'll tell you, Joe, Tony, he can do it. He is considered by many to be the best center fielder in the National League. And as you mentioned, on artificial surface, it makes it all the more difficult as you see him sweep deep into the gap in left center field to cut that ball off and really recover and get a quick throw off to the infield to keep Carlton Fisk to a long single. You could see from that outfield camera following him how far he got over in that gap. And that's what Sparky was talking about, that raw speed. Because when it hits that artificial surface, it really jumps. And here's Lynn, who was out on strikes. Hot smash, almost got Fisk, a base hit in the right field. Carlton had to stop to let the ball get by him. Lynn jumped on a high pitch and drilled it in the right field. Now it's first and second, nobody out. Here it is again. Here's Fisk coming close to getting hit by this hard smash. Which may or may not have, we don't know for sure, have prevented him from going to third base. Said pretty sharply, Griffey was playing toward right center. Pedro Barbone now has gone down to the bullpen for Cincinnati to get loosened up. Barbone. Rose is way back at third. Nobody out. Petroselli with Evans, the on deck batter. Nice play by Bench. He has done that throughout the whole series. Not only has he come up with it, watch him get his body in front of this ball to prevent it. Look at that. Get him right in the middle of the chest protector. And then he plays it off the protector. Morgan comes in to say something to him. Now you infielders go there and say, come on, settle down. I want you to settle down. You go in sometimes because the manager says go in. You don't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then that pitcher runs you out of there. It's Freddie Norman, and he gives you the look he gives the catcher. <laughs> you take off. 1 0 pitch. High pop fly. Concepcion is under it. It's an infield fly. Infield fly. Petroselli is out. One away, and here is Dwight Evans. Evans hit into a force play his first time up. Hit 316 in his last 48 games. He and Fisk were the two hottest hitters on this Red Sox club going through September. He's become a more aggressive hitter. At one time, he took too many pitches. Johnny Pesky has worked with him, tried to make him more aggressive. Gets by Bench this time. It'll be a wild pitch, and both runners advance. And that's a big play. But as a bunt, looked like a screwball. For a while, it looked like all the time was going to hit Evans. Bench just couldn't get around. That's kind of a funny pitch because usually, if it's a curveball, when it hits, it would have gone to Bench's right side because it goes in the opposite way because of the rotation. That's one of those pitches, as the late and so wonderful Casey Stengel used to call a 55 foot curveball. Here comes Larry Shepard. He has Barbone ready, but. Does he come out when they take him out? Marty is usually Sparky. No, Sparky is the man who comes out and brings the pitcher back with him, Tony. And Sparky made the comment earlier tonight that he felt like he had to have six strong innings out of Freddie Norman in this ball game. Evans waits in the pitch. Slow curveball. See Bench give uh, Carl Fisk a quick look. One ball, one strike, one out. Two nothing. We're at the top of the fourth. Cincinnati's leading. And the infield conceding one run on a ground ball. Deep to right center field. This could be trouble. Way back there. Off the wall. Two runs are going to score. Here comes Lynn. There goes Evans heading for third. There's the throw. Oh, nobody backing him up. Nobody backing him up. And luckily. Oh, well, luckily is right. Nobody was behind him. Norman was back in the plate. They're halfway in between, it seemed like. Here it is, Geronimo, the strongest arm in the outfield, throwing the strongest arm in the infield. That's Concepcion with a relay in right center field. And Freddie Norman was hung up as Zimmer is saying, whoa, wait a second, don't go and hit the screen, protecting the uh, dugouts. Evans triples to right center field, tying the game. So there it is, all tied up at two apiece on another clutch hit by Dwight Evans. Boy, two days in a row, that big guy's come on. Now the infield has to move in. Evans is on at third base with the triple. 
Here's Burleson. And there's a base hit. And Boston takes the three to two lead. Burleson's trying for second and makes it. What a piece of base running. Seth Davidson says, no way. They took for granted that Burleson would stop at first base. Well, it shows the scouting report of the Red Sox. If the ball is handled by Foster, we'll take some chances. Not on Geronimo. Burleson knows that Foster fielded the ball. Seth Davidson of the National League right there, eating dirt with Morgan and Burleson. Here's Evans on third. With the infield in the way it was, an easy base set had they been playing back. An easy out. Here's Burleson again coming into second base. Offline throw by Foster. He takes a little while to get rid of the ball. But just made it. Rick Burleson singles over Concepcion and Boston leads three to two. Sparky Anderson goes to his bullpen for Pedro Barbon. Seconds, you got one out. Okay. You have to come to a stop, Pete. Now I'm telling you, one out and that on second. You look in here and get in the spot. And Barbon has to face the hot bat of Luis Tiant. Luis Tiant has just fouled a pitch off with Burleson on its second base. Barbon, a good fastball. Burleson, don't look now, man. Seven base hits for him. Him and Petroselli. Rico, a base hit his first time up. And Tian, a base hit in the center field. Geronimo, a good arm, and Zimmer holds him up and bench now. And look at <laughs> Tian made a big turn at first base, and nobody was there because Perez was the cutoff man, and Louis goes scampering back. Really wasn't much that Rick Burleson could do. And here again, the scouting report say, not on Geronimo. All the way on the fly. First base was open. There's Perez in the cutoff position, allowing Tian to make the wide turn at first. Dion singles, and that raises his batting average for the series to 500. Burleson get hurt down there at third base. Trainers out there, Charlie Moore looking at his leg. Now out comes Daryl Johnson. He may have pulled something to be out of the game. He's limping. Well, looks. He had to pull up quickly, and, and it may be one of those quick stops because he had all the intentions of the scoring. And the, you can see it's a left ankle. And sometimes when you put those brakes on a little bit too hard, you may pull something. Here's Burleson coming off second base. He thinks he's got a chance to score. And now watch Zimmer. He's got a, well, he's holding him all the way. Right there on the artificial surface. That's where it happened. May have jammed that ankle. Didn't mean to swing. Little tap. Perez can't get it. Everybody's safe. It's 4 to 2, Boston. Looked like Tony took his eye off the ball as Benitez ducked a high fastball. Barbone makes a good pitch. Really jammed him, but Tony Perez lets it skitter under the edge of his glove. Had no chance for a play anywhere. We got a 4 to 2 game. Here's Benitez. That's a jam job. Jam City. The Red Sox get a break. Four to two, Boston out in front, and here is Denny Doyle. It's an error on Perez. Strike. Activity in the Cincinnati bullpen as Barbone delivers a fastball outside, one and one. There is Clay Carroll, the Hawk. be redundant to say he was in there last night because anybody who warms up tonight you could say that about him. That's going to be playable. Pete Rose and Bench who's going to get it. Rose takes charge. Here's Jastrzemski three for 13 in the World Series the Red Sox four to two. This is the ninth man to bat in his fourth inning. Off the handle, a little looper coming off fast. Geronimo and can't get it. Here comes Tiant. He's going to score. Benicus is held up. He had ideas of coming around. Cesar broke back on the ball. He looped around the ball, starting the left center field. That's what artificial service can do to the ball. Look at that hop. So the Red Sox have taken a three-run lead. It's five to two. 
Here's the man who got it all started, Carlton Fisk. He drilled one into the gap in left center field. It was cut off by Geronimo. Fisk has taken plenty of time to give uh, Tian a little chance to breathe here. Tian's been on base both times. He walked in the third. Now he's come around to score after he singled. There is Sparky Anderson. He's given signals to his people. Five big runs outside. 2 0. Oh. Now, you know, that Zimmer, very active coach. In fact, Daryl Johnson, the manager, simply says to Zimmer, go out and coach your usual game. And that means that the runners will be running. Got under it. Left center field. Concepcion, now Geronimo takes charge, makes the play. And that ends the fourth inning, a good one for Boston. 5 to 2 in the bottom of the fourth. Red Sox out in front. Five to two, the Red Sox with five runs in the top of the fourth have taken the lead, and that's the way this series is going. And tomorrow, game five, there it is, begins with the baseball world, and you'll get a good look at the last of his breed. Max Patkin, the baseball clown, will be our show. And then if Boston should win this game, of course, we go back to Fenway Park for game six. Game seven, there's a lot of ifs, I'll tell you something, but these two clubs evenly matched, fundamentally sound, and every game has just been a real, real battle. Game five tomorrow. Game six will begin 12.30 on Saturday Eastern time should Boston win this game. And there goes Tian into some gyrations now. He gives it a little dipsy do. He starts putting it on a little bit more when he gets ahead. Bob, let's see if you knuckle balls. Now he's starting to look around. He's got those hinges in his body all oiled up, and he'll start to flop around with that raggedy Ann arm ahead. The real battler, this fella. Right field. Way back there it is. Man, he gave it a good chase. Foul ball. Evans playing toward Harris Power, which is right center field or left center field. He has a long run. Not much room there. He has to break himself very quickly. You can see the padding to prevent any injuries in that corner. Not much room down in those corners. Burleson's playing short left field for Paris. Did you see that move? <laughs> he turned completely to home plate. Looked at direct center field. Watch this. If you're sitting in center field, you got to see his eyeballs. Look at that. You know, and it's calculated. It just doesn't happen. This man figures it out. Here's a 3-2 pitch. Struck him out. Foul tip held on to by Carlton Fist. That's the first strikeout. Tiant to bench. He missed outside. Marty, I'm trying to recall the number. Maybe you can. And it's a high amount of games in which the Reds have come back in the late innings to win ball games. Around 39 games, Tony, during the season. It's a lot. Fastball taken. Fisk the low target. Oh, what a pitch that was. Right on the outside corner. Johnny Bench thought it was low. And I'll tell you, he is really upset. Look at it. Carlton did a nice job of oh. snatching the ball in a couple of inches. And he gave the umpire a good look. And John gave him a good speech. Fouls it back. I don't think you fool too many umpires these days by snatching the ball back in, do you? I don't think so either, Tony, except that when you're, you don't make your pitcher look wild, Bench does it, Fisk does it so well, you get some of those. Left field, Benitez. Loses his cap but makes the play. Foster, who bounced out his first time up. Off the handle. Doyle backhands it. Long throw. Not in time. That one went into the dugout. And it goes into the dugout. That throw into the dugout. Boston running it, hit the fence. Here's Doyle showing some good rage. He didn't have time to ride himself to get good balance. Not much on the throw, but he did get a, have a good job getting the ball away. Yes, 
might have left the, ball, uh, the bag a little bit sooner so he could have stopped the ball from going through. And he has he was going to get his man. Foster hits a quiet 300, doesn't he, Marty? Just a steady 300. He really does, Joe. And, uh, of course, they talk about this season for Cincinnati. The big key when they talk about it will be the movement of Pete Rose to third and Foster to left field that really turned this team around. That was the move that kicked the big red machine in the gear. And here is Concepcion. Two men out, 5-2 Boston leading. We're in the bottom half of the fourth inning. Good fastball. That's the best fastball he's thrown, Tony. Burleson was telling me before the ball game that he played against Concepcion several years ago in Venezuela in the Winter Leagues. And he said he never thought that Concepcion would hit. He stood so far away from the plate, held a bat on the end, and couldn't reach pitches outside part of the plate. But Big Clue got a hold of him. Look what he's made of. Really a, well, just a tremendous shortstop. Hopped up, going out. Burleson coming in, Lynn. Could be triple. And it's Foster. Scores, and it's a two-base hit for Concepcion. There's no reason for that ball dropping. It was a tough play for anybody who had to make it. Lynn usually comes and gets these kinds of balls near collision. This is what happens when you get out of Fenway on this artificial surface just a shade deeper and he couldn't get it. Concepcion hits one to left center where some of the Red Sox players decide to hold the meeting. Foster scores and it's five to three Boston. Sparky and Klazuski enjoyed it. Nobody seemed to take charge on that play. They were all reaching, much like the, the same feeling you get trying to look for the light switch in the dark. Everybody was just reaching. When you go out as a shortstop, you're looking at the ball and you're just waiting for somebody to crunch you. And that's the way it looked, Tony. And Burleson just kind of felt his way there and it cost him a run. 5 3. Here is Geronimo. A little looper down the left field line. Bonique is coming over. Can't get it. It gets by him. It'll be extra bases. Two for Geronimo. He's heading for third. Here's the throw. It is not in time. Yo, know, I've got to wonder if Juan Bonique, as you look like he got a good jump, had some trouble with the lights. He's, he started after the ball very well, and then he just shied away from it. You see again what happens in artificial surface as opposed to a grass field. Here's the play on the relay from Burleson to Petroselli. And I believe we're going to have a pinch hitter now for the Reds. Geronimo is the hitter. And Geronimo lines down the left field line. It gets past Juan Benicus. And it goes for a three-base hit. The score, five to four. Look at that Cincinnati bench. It's five to four, and Crowley has come out in the on-deck circle. This is his first appearance. Played in his 1973 series for Baltimore. Open one as a pinch hitter. Hi, one and one. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. Strike is called a fastball. Struck him out. Decart inside, went to the outside corner. That ends it. But at the end of four, it's Boston five, Cincinnati four. The preceding announcement was furnished by Major League Baseball. Great shot is tremendous ballpark here. Riverfront Stadium as Clay Carroll comes on. Seven and five. Hard thrower. This guy rears back and pumps, Marty. Sure does, Joe. He's got the basic pitches, fastball, slider, curveball, and set a new record this season for the most appearances ever by a Cincinnati Reds pitcher. Lynn jumps on the first pitch as an easy out. He broke Nuxie's record, didn't he? Joe Nuxhall? Sure did. Broadcast with you during the regular season, still pitches batting practice almost every day. 
This is Carroll's third game this series, his 12th in World Series appearances. Enrico Petroselli, 18.8 home runs, pretty good. Foul ball out of play. Enrico was going for one. He tried to put a little charge into that one. Blake Carroll, strike two. And there is Evans. What a clutch hitter he's been. Petroselli out on strikes. Cut the outside corner. Although it didn't show in yesterday's ball game, the Reds just keep throwing quality pitchers at you out of the pen, and that's been a big plus for them all year long. Here's Dwight Evans, who hit into a force play, and then triple in the fourth inning, a big triple. Drove in two runs. Four for 12 in a series. Ooh. He really drilled it off Carroll in the right field. Carroll, although hit, goes over to first base. Hit right back at him. Bench calls time. He's going to check with the Hawk. The Hawk is stalking back to the mound. He doesn't even want to rub. He, he knows his spark. He'll take him out. I'm all right. He got Jolin pretty good. Couldn't see exactly where it hit him. He's not going to tell anybody yet. He wants to give me the ball. I want to pitch. That's all. <laughs> Evans tried to say something to him as he was over at first base to say, how are you? There's Larry Starr, the trainer. I tell you, how <laughs> many guys have gotten that bullpen to him? It's got to be a factor, and this guy's a real battler anyhow. Joe, I'll tell you, this guy does not want to come out of the game. In fact, last night when Sparky took him out, he went into the dugout, threw his glove up against the wall, and pretty much made it known that he was not happy at all with it. Let's look again. If we can see where the ball hits Clay Carroll. A vicious line drive. Looked like a sinker. You can see what a pitcher has. Absolutely no chance at all. Where'd that hit him? Hit him right in the La Bonza, Right in the boiler. <laughs> the hole. Right in the <laughs> boiler. That is chronic heartburn where he got hit. Oh, Watch the ball now. He sees the ball, and then at the last minute, it's like he's got handcuffs on. See the ball? Now watch it. He'll look up. See him look up? He's protecting his face is all he's trying to do. Yes, sir. Got him right in the boiler. But he's all right. No, no, it wasn't the boiler. What was it? La Bonza. Uh, he got it. The Hawk is ready. All the folks down in Alabama where he's from, happy. The Hawk is okay. This is Burleson. Look at those statistics. Seven for 13. One one pitch. Concepcion's gonna have to hustle and makes his play at second base and they get Evans. He could not have gotten Burleson. So we'll go to the bottom of the fifth, five four, Red Sox over Cincinnati. A 5-4 ball game, and these Boston Red Sox can put it on the scoreboard, and now to give you the play-by-play -play the rest of the way, voice of the Cincinnati Reds, Marty Brenneman. Thank you, Joe, and hello again, everybody. Well, we've got a pretty much of a carbon copy of what we have witnessed the last two games in the 75 World Series, one-run games. Saturday at Fenway Park, 3-2 Cincinnati. Last night, the Reds pulling it out by a run, and 5-4 Boston as the Cincinnati Reds come to bat in the bottom of the fifth inning. Louis Tion will be working to the top of the Reds' batting order as we take a look at this massive crowd at Riverfront Stadium tonight. Rose has had a hit. He's scored a run. Has hit the ball hard two times. Tion starts him off with an off-speed pitch that misses the strike zone. Reds got two off of Tion in the first inning. Then he went to work, retired ten batters in a row before the Reds were able to come up with an infield two-out single by Foster in the last inning that started it off. Ball two to Rose. On deck for the Cincinnati Reds is right fielder Ken Griffey. Pitches foul back. Cincinnati trying to battle back from behind after at one point leading 2 nothing before that five run fourth inning. And Dion a pitch away from walking Pete Rose. Rose checking out third base coach Alex Grammas. So Rose opens the fifth inning with a base on balls, and that's the first walk that Tion is allowed tonight. Naked walk number two, Joe Morgan getting a walk in the first inning. 
Carlton Fisk now going out to the mound to talk with Tion as once again manager Daryl Johnson is going to get some activity going in his bullpen. Well, Marty, when this game started, I remember you said immediately that we look at the bullpen. We got uh, Paul and Burton. Burton's a left-hander. You said if Rose got on, that there was something was going to happen. He did break on the very first pitch. Let's see if it happens now. I'd be surprised if it happened again Joe I know Sparky made the comment that they did not even expect Rose to go at all in this series but we'll see he's on with a leadoff walk and now Griffey who has doubled a run across and bounced to the mound and two tries. Four one. Here's a fly ball hit back into deep right field looking up as a right fielder Evans but now will make the catch trying to decoy Pete Rose it looked like as he sure was. took a glance up as if to make, try and make Rose believe the ball was going to be out of here and then made the catch. He sure did pretty shrewd play which didn't work. He's trying to make it look as you said Marty like the ball's going out of the park. The thing I like about that too Tony is after he decoyed he still got himself in position to make yeah. that good throw. He's thinking all the time. Here's Joe Morgan with Rose at first one out now the Reds trailing the Red Sox five to four is Cincinnati bats in the bottom of the fifth inning. Dion perpetual motion out there. Breaking ball is high to Morgan. Throws a walk, a fly ball deep right by Griffey. And here's the man in Morgan you got a pitch to. Peon right around the plate with that pitch, but Joe not having any of it. It's ball two. And the short lead by Pete Rose. Peon needs a strike, and he now goes three balls and no strike. Louis throwing a lot of pitches in this ball game. So Louis Teon getting ready to throw a big pitch here. Three and two the count. Rose breaking, and it's ball four high. Uncharacteristic of Louis Tion, he's given up two walks to the Reds in the fifth inning. Now you head to the power part of the Cincinnati Reds batting order. Daryl Johnson with a decision: Do I stay with my best, the man who's done it for me in clutch situations? Do I go to a bullpen that is young out there right now? Paul and Burton is going with experience. Well, here's a guy who has not had a hit in the series. The only regular for either club, Tony Perez, 0 for 11. Has bounced to short, has struck out swinging. 1 1 pitch. Bouncing ball hit by the mound. That could be trouble. Play to first base, and they get the out at first. But Rose advances to third base. Tiao with that follow through, falling off towards first, has a little dribbler go right by him, and a pretty good play by second baseman Denny Doyle. No chance to get Morgan, as you see. Look where he is on the third base side of second. Fortunately, at Perez, who does not run well. But Tony Perez is ground ball, and he's out 4-3. Doyle to Yaskremski moves Rose to third base, and Joe Morgan on to second. Here's Johnny Bench. I got to believe I'd put him on. I got to <laughs> believe I got a better chance of hitting than he has. <laughs> See what happens. First base open, second and third, two outs. Bench doubled a run across with a long blast into deep right center in the first inning that hit a fly ball to left in the fourth. So he's had one of the six Going Cincinnati to pitch hits. Going to yep. pitch to him. Going to pitch to him. Two in scoring position, two down, and strike one is called. He's going to make three pitches on that low outside corner, and if he comes inside, it's got to be to keep him honest. There's no way that he's going to give him a good ball to hit. It's going to be the worst mistake in the world, and he just doesn't make those kind of mistakes. Miss tying away with that pitch. 1 1 delivery high and inside. Joe Tion unusually wild here in the fifth inning. 2 1 delivery. Swing and a miss, and he simply challenged him with a high fastball. Looked like it was out of the strike zone, and bench with base runners in scoring position is. Widening his strike zone to try to drive in some runs. I think that's not a slugger's grip. Look at the little finger on his left hand over the knob. If he gets any lower, he'll just be having a handful of hands. Bench with a chance to drive in some runs for Cincinnati. He hits a fly ball. Banik is toward the line. 
And the red threat dies in the fifth inning. No runs, no hits, a couple of men left on. And after five full innings of play, it's the Red Sox five, the Reds four. Play Carroll against Louis Tion, Boston sixth inning, and Tion quickly behind two strikes to Carroll. Strike three is called, and plate umpire Dick Stello had to think about that pitch for a moment. That's the second time that he's done that tonight. Louis doesn't like it. It's a curveball that didn't back him out too much. He's on his heels. The speech that he makes here is the speech that all pitchers make as we watch it once again. Yeah. We almost say they say when I'm hitting you call it a strike when I'm pitching you call it a ball. You've but heard it Tony. Here's a ground ball to third Rose stumbles writes himself and very quickly two down for the Red Sox. Here's Pete playing way up in front of the bag in case Benicas had attempted to bunt. Pepper Martin. Pepper Martin. In the that? chest, off the shoulder. I kind of believe he might want to get away from those seams, too, Tony. He could be a bad hop. Dennis Menke had one of those around the uh, cutout uh, part, the sliding pit. Now, Denny Doyle with two out. He's hitless tonight and three times up, and the first pitch is a ball inside to him. Carroll working his second inning in relief, and he's a third Cincinnati pitcher. Norman Borbone and now Clay Carroll. One ball and one strike. ball hit up the middle and that's a base hit hit number 11 for the Red Sox as Doyle punches one up the middle with two down to extend the inning for first baseman Carl Yastrzemski slowly hit ground ball Perez he'll shove a line to Carroll who gets there before he has does and that's all for the Red Sox sixth inning no runs a hit they leave one man on and after five and a half it's Boston five and Cincinnati four Defensive change for the Boston Red Sox. Rick Miller has gone into play left field, a left hander replacing Juan Benicas. But well, Daryl Johnson going to his bench in hopes of getting a little bit better defensive work out of that left field spot as Miller replaces Benicas and George Foster will open up the sixth inning for Cincinnati. Pitch is missing outside and high. Joe, this is the time of the ball game where you've got to wonder with all the pitches Tion has thrown, running the bases, the pressures he's had in clutch situations, if he's going to tire. We'll watch him closely. Rick, fly ball to left center field. There's Freddie Lynn under and makes a catch. And as Foster leads off the six with a fly ball, the Reds get further activity underway in their bullpen. Young man who has won the two games that Cincinnati has chalked up in this series, Raleigh Eastwick. You know, Tony, watching uh, Tiant work, and just to what you were mentioning before, as Eastwick continues to throw, about is he tiring? The one thing you can't measure is the man's heart. You just don't know what competitive fires are in there. You go by past reputation, and brother, you know this guy has got some kind of credentials. One down, sixth inning for Cincinnati. Davey Concepcion, the hitter, he had a loop double into shallow left center field, hit off the end of the bat in the fourth inning. Throw in a run. Shortens up on the bat and takes a breaking pitch. Marty Allen Roth charts every pitch. He tells us that Louis Tion threw 100 pitches in the first five innings. And that's a lot. Concepcion ahead on the count, two and one, and he pops it up. Second baseman Doyle going out, but Evans calling for it, two down. Tony question is there a difference in the strike zone American League versus National League talked a lot of players who've gone to both and they all say that National Leaguers give them the low strikes give them a little bit more of the outside corner the American Leaguers give them the high strike Bobby Mercer told me something interesting this year he said I was surprised hearing what I heard that they call more inside and high pitches strikes on them. so you <laughs> depends upon the hitter the player I guess and the year he's on the umpire yeah the year he's having Every umpire is a little different. Last couple of innings, Tion has been awfully tough with men on, especially in scoring position. Breaking ball will be out of play off to the left. Well, anyway, we got a chance here. You know, we see many celebrities. John Gary sang the national anthem. Paul Simon threw out the first ball at Yankee Stadium, and Simon and Garfunkel are being reunited this Saturday night on NBC's Saturday Night. 
at 1130 Eastern time. I don't know how you feel Tony but Simon and Garfunkel I mean that's Ruth and Gary. Where have you gone Joe DiMaggio. Mm. San Francisco I think at Fisherman's Wharf. <laughs> that's great that they're coming back you know the Beatles uh, got back together and now Simon and Garfunkel will get to see him Saturday night. Okay, the one and two pitch again. Oh. Swung on, a looper that will be in for a base hit. That was a high limb. It was that American Legion high roundhouse curve, and he just couldn't let it get by. No a little bit of the hesitation pitch as Tian stopped with that front foot. A little bit up, and that's what hurt him. He didn't hit it hard. Had it been down, it had been a ground ball. I don't think you could hear that ball hit the bat. He kind of swung it out there like he hit it off his elbow. That was a banana stalk. Sparky Anderson once again going to his bench. There's Daryl Cheney swinging a bat. He's a left-handed hitter. And well, interesting because Sparky has Danny Dreesen, a most potent hitter on the bench, and a left-handed swinger himself, who obviously is saving for possibly a later time in this game. Probably the, saving for a man in scoring position. The two outs of factor as Stan Williams comes out to, uh, I guess, go over strategy. Cheney not known as a power hitter. He had a, had a big day in Chicago with a big home run, but he's a spray type hitter. Cheney has been in two other World Series for Cincinnati, 70 and 72, looking for his first hit. He's 0 for 8. Deion draws even at two balls and two strikes. Louie with a lot of different kinds of fastballs. That one he looked like he sunk on him. Came a little bit three quarters. You'll come over the top. It's a riding fastball. You just don't pick up the ball as you mentioned earlier, Joe. Seems to be on you quickly. He hides it so well. He just gives you everything. Elbows, kneecaps, fingernails. He's just a tough pitcher. And he struck him out, and that's all for Cincinnati. Right on the target. No runs, one hit in the inning. No errors with a man left on. And after six full, it's the Red Sox five and the Reds four. Here's that last strike. Look at Fisk giving the target. Now watch that ball, how close it gets to that target. Boy, he's got great control. That is a tough pitch to handle, low outside. Fisk gives it to him right there, and he hits it. New Cincinnati pitcher is right-hander Raleigh Eastwick, and this is a young man that Sparky Anderson went to many times during the season, and he has carried over that pattern here in the World Series. Right-hander from Haddonfield, New Jersey, Eastwick five and three during the season with a 260 earned run average, and as we mentioned earlier, he has already chalked up two victories in the series for the Reds and has a chance to become the first relief pitcher ever to win three games in one World Series. Tied three relief pitchers by winning two. The other is Jesse Barnes of the Giants in 1921, Hugh Casey of the Dodgers in 1947, and most recently Larry Sherry of the Los Angeles Dodgers in 1959. Carlton Fisk leading off the seventh for Boston, who leads in this game five to four. Fisk has had a single, a run scored, and three times up. Eastwood giving up the game tying Homer to Evans in the ninth inning last night and then the Reds coming back to win the game. Here's a pop. Tony Perez waiting. Mr. Bowie Kuhn. Joe Cronin up behind him, Mrs. Cronin, who is an avid baseball fan, obviously, and she keeps the most complicated scorecard I have ever seen. <laughs> she records everything. Probably that question oh, that gentleman she's just asked. Corrected. <laughs> Freddie Lynn, first pitch inning, a ground ball to Joe Morgan. Two down, seventh inning for Boston. In the two appearances for Eastwick, he's worked three and two thirds innings, has allowed a run on four hits. At 22 saves in 1975 to tie Cardinal relief ace Al Raboski for the National League lead in that department. Grounded by the mound, but a routine inning for Raleigh Eastwick. He sets down Fisk, Glenn, and Petroselli in order. First one, two, three inning of the game. Reds pitching against Boston in the middle of the seventh, five to four, Red Sox. 
NBC Sports in the baseball world. That starts it off. We begin coverage of Game 7 if we have it at 12.30. And that's where it begins as far as Game 7 with the baseball world. If the World Series is completed, then we've got a big doubleheader football game. 1 o'clock, Baltimore, New England, but Miami and the Jets. Greasy against Namath, 4 o'clock. Oakland plays Cincinnati, and of course, Grandstand will be before and wrapping around all the NFL action. That's next Sunday. If there's a seventh game, we begin at 12.30 with the baseball world. Otherwise, 1 o'clock football, but 12.30 Grandstand. Louis Tion will work to the top half of the Reds' batting order here in the seventh inning, and Pete Rose with a foul strike on Tion's first pitch. Rose is single. He's lied to center. He's also had a walk. Daryl Johnson, who has kept the fires burning in his bullpen here in the last few innings, is going with right-hander Dick Drago. One ball and one strike. Rose started to go after the pitch. There's Daryl Johnson. Don Zimmer seated off to his left. Johnny Pesky, his first base coach, to the right. That's Popeye and Needle Nose. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Disney movie. Popeye and Needle Nose. Rose trying to get on with what would be the tie and run. He hits a shot, but Denny Doyle right in his tracks, and there's one away. Gritty, that's the word for that guy. Here's Rose. Look how close in Fisk is to him, Joe. He's way up underneath him almost. Really is. hard. You know, we talk about not being in agreement and all that, but these umpires, you got to tip your hat. All first time in a World Series. And they umpire that ball under tremendous amount of pressure. Kenny Griffey the batter one out of the seventh inning for Cincinnati and there's Doyle again getting it on the act two away. Joe Morgan has been on twice he's both times reached with walks in the first inning also in the fifth fly to left field is only official at bat three two pitch he hits one and hit it a time. But Freddie Lynn will be there, and that's all for the Reds as they are retired in order in the seventh inning. Three up, three down. Freddie Lynn making a play on the hard hit ball to deep right center field by Joe Morgan. Took a step in, then broke quickly back on the ball, and when all was said and done, made it a fairly routine play. So it's three up and three down for the Reds, and through seven, it's Boston five and Cincinnati four. White Evans, Rick Burleson, and Louis Tiot scheduled batters in the inning. One and two the count on Evans as he hits one into deep left center field. Geronimo there one down. Here's a shortstop Rick Burleson. He also had a run scoring base hit in the fourth inning a double the left center field is only hit tonight. What an impressive figure there 78 times he has struck out in two seasons with this Boston team. Rose left side. Two down. Here's Louis Tiot. I'll tell you, they have to respect this guy here at Riverfront Stadium. He put on quite a show at Fenway Park at home Saturday, and well, he's he's pitched a battling type of game. There's a Boston Red Sox contingent led by Louis's wife. She still had that horn or whatever's going. Talked to a fan that sat near that section, Joe, last night, and they said she was going with it full tilt from beginning until end. <laughs> Grounded by the mound as Eastwick tried to come up with it with his bare hand. Concepcion makes a play. So the Red Sox are up and down in order for the second consecutive inning against right-hander Raleigh Eastwick. And after seven and one half, it remains the Red Sox five, the Reds four. Well, there's a bit of encouragement for Louis Tion, a sign hanging off the facing of the second deck and left center. Time running out for the Cincinnati Reds in this game. Tony Perez opening up the eighth inning, still looking for his first hit. Strike one call. He's 0 for 13. Perez hoping that 13 number proves to be good luck right now. As Tion prepares to throw the one and two to Tony oh. Perez. Here's a fly ball hit back in the left center field as Miller is there and there's one down. 
He dipped on this one. Just watch his head. Now, if you're concentrating on the man's eyes, watch what happens. He's looking at you. Down he goes. Around he goes in the left center field. And here he comes. <laughs> He's amazing. Amazing. Johnny Bench with one out. Doubled and three times up as it fly balls twice to left field. Pretty good pitch right there. And a pretty good cut as we take a look at Will McEnany. Sparky Anderson has used one of his young lions, Raleigh Eastwick, tonight. Still the Cincinnati pitcher and McEnany working. Pops him foul, but on a play. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. Throwing nothing but strikes over the last couple of innings, and he has struck out Johnny Bench. He still had a pretty good fastball left in the arm over the top of the bench. That was a good fastball, Joe. Yes, it was, and the one he threw before him, he even just matched strength against strength. Bench had a good cut, didn't connect, and he came right back, came from over the top and challenged him. I go back to the, what I said earlier, Tony. I tell you, when you look, if you could look inside a man, you would have a pretty good yardstick. With the credentials this fella has, you know he's got heart. His arm may be tiring, but he's still coming at you. Foster with two down as you take a look at Louis Tiot. Ground ball, base hit to center field. Freddie Lynn up with the ball, quickly back to the infield. As far as we know now, the scheduled pitcher for Daryl Johnson's Red Sox is going to be Bill Lee. Tell you, Tony, a lot of the Reds players felt like Lee pitched a better game against them Sunday than Tion did in pitching the shutout Saturday. He had excellent control, had his breaking stuff going. He held the runners close. Well, the crowd getting caught up here on the base hit to center by Foster. Here's Concepcion. Davey one for three, a double, a knock, and a run. Here's a fly ball. That's got a chance. Nope. The right fielder Evans quickly over to make the play. And Concepcion and the Reds are retired in inning number eight. No runs, a hit, one left. And as we go to the ninth, Boston five, Cincinnati four. We're in the ninth inning. Eastwick will be pitching to Rick Miller, who makes his first appearance at the plate in this World Series. Miller coming on in the bottom of the sixth inning as a defensive replacement for Juan Benicas in left. Boston five, Cincinnati four. Possibility looms of a third straight one run game among the four that we've had so far. Miller, 194, a batting average during the year. No homers, 15 RBIs. He's a brother in law of Carlton Fisk. Ball strike. Miller married to Fisk's sister, Janet. Saying a lot, but some consider Miller the best outfielder on this club when you figure Lynn and Evans when Yastrzemski plays out there. Also, he might be the best base runner. Ball Eastwood. Ball is fouled away. It's two strikes. Seven straight Boston batters have gone down. Eastwick has retired six in a row. Joe, are you like me? Several times during these series games, I've wondered what the difference Jim Rice might have been in this series. Oh, you have to think that. You have to think that. And you have to wonder what's running through his mind. What a disappointment. Unfortunately. Here's Morgan playing back behind second and got enough on the throw to get the speedy Rick Miller. One down. So Eastwick continues to roll along as he gets Miller on a bouncing ball to the Reds gold glove second baseman Joe Morgan. Marty, is Eastwick the youngster uh, I may have mixed up who was quarter saying he doesn't get nervous but he's got a brother who does all the worrying? He's the one, Joe. He's got a twin brother. And he's the worrier, the yes, twin brother. Not Raleigh. He said that ground ball to second said he has never, ever been worried in athletic competition, ever. And he is most emphatic about it. So when he wants to worry, he calls his brother. Gets him on the telephone. <laughs> Designated worrier. <laughs> <laughs> the DW. The That's old DW. DW. The old basic DW. Here's a veteran, Carl Yastrzemski, with two out, four for 15. Two hits tonight, including a base hit that knocked in a run. Red Sox bunched them five runs, all of their runs in one inning, and had six of their 11 hits in that fourth. 
Carlton Fisk is on deck. When he wraps that bat, by that I mean he points that bat towards the pitcher, he gets that cut. Now watch that bat come forward and in around. Whoop. Boy, if nothing else, Tony, that'll get every bone in your body loose. The old days, you'd pop a button on your shirt. 1-1 one, one the count. It's down low and inside. Two balls and a strike. You know, this when guys swing like that behind the plate, you can feel your mask start to come off the suction just, <laughs> just like that. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You don't believe that. Can I tell you about Tian's father who picked the guy off? <laughs> well, Eastwick has been down and in on the last two pitches. He's 3-1 and one on Yastrzemski, who backs away from the plate. He's on with a walk. Fifty five thousand six hundred and sixty seven here tonight as we once again watch Mrs. Louis Tion lead the Boston cheering. <laughs> Louis doing some thinking on the bench right now. He knows who the hitters coming up are the last of the night for the Reds. Here's Tion. Here's Carlton Fisk at the plate with two away. Yastrzemski on at first, and strike one is called. The sure. first base runner that the Red Sox have had off of Eastwood. Towering fly ball, Concepcion calling for it. Foster behind, David has it, and that's the inning. No runs in the ninth for the Red Sox, no hits. No errors, a man left. Five to four, Boston after eight and a half. Louis Tion, three outs away from picking up his second World Series victory of 75 as Sparky Anderson goes to pacing in the Reds' dugout. Joe, you caught last halves of inning in World Series competition. What's on your mind right now if you're catching Tion? Well, pretty much what you said about who the batters are, what you're going to do, and make sure that you realize that he's still got that good stuff and you don't let your heart, your emotions, take over for you. This is where the guts comes in, that if he starts to lose it, you're going to have to tell somebody. Cesar Geronimo will start it off as Jim Burton and Dick Drago, a left-hander and a right-hander, start throwing. Geronimo has had a couple of hits. You can hear in the background, this crowd wants some action. Swung on, a shot hit down the right field line, but a foul ball. The defense is an interesting one to me, Tony. Petroselli at third base is actually guarding the line more. You'll see Petroselli there than uh, Yastrzemski at first base with Geronimo, a left-hand batter up there. He doesn't want to go to 3-2, I'll tell you. He wants it to happen right here on 2-2. Two -two. Well, let's see what happens. Two balls, two strikes. Line drive. Six. They hit the right field for Geronimo. Tony, it appears that Geronimo has been sitting on the off-speed pitches of T.I. tonight. Yeah, right from the start of the game. He's got three or four. He's hit the ball hard today. So there's a tie and run. The Cincinnati Reds dugout. Here's a man who put down the butt that created the controversy last night. Ed Armbrister, a little used during the regular season by Sparky Anderson. He's a rookie. Fine runner. And a pretty good runner over at first base in Geronimo. Oh, it begins to get a bit loud at Riverfront Stadium. There's a pitch, a ball butted foul off the first base side. Petroselli creeping in from third base. Geronimo at first. But, and it's a dandy. Keon on to Doyle covering and a fine butt by Armbrister. He did his job. Geronimo on at second base in scoring position. And there it is. Watch Carlton Fisk bolt out from behind the plate. He has been an excellent butter all year long. Putting at the proper place as Yastrzemski had a hold. The runner, Rico, would have had a better shot. And 
our Mr. Luke won perfectly. As easy as Tian made it look in the first game, that's how tough this one is. Geronimo leads off the ninth with his third hit of the game. Arm Brister is up there. Arm Brister bunts, this time without incident. And it moves Geronimo to second. Luis Tian is concerned. Mrs. Tian is concerned. Daryl Johnson is concerned. What do you guys think? I got a left-hander down here, Louie. Can you get him? All right. All right. You get right after them. If that ball comes back to you, make sure to one out there. And get after him good. Come on. It'll bring up Pete Rose with a chance to drive in the tie and run. He's hit the ball three times hard tonight. Once for a base hit in the first inning. Marty, you've got to think once again of the late inning comebacks that Cincinnati has had all year long. Well, T.I. taking a little bit extra time as he goes to rubbing up the baseball. He'll give us a chance to send along our thanks to our statistician, Alan Roth, our production stage manager, Jim O'Gorman, and our field supervisor, Huey McDermott. One man out. Runner at second base as Geronimo takes his lead. Tian with a look. Full up. Burleson playing games at second base with Geronimo, and it's two balls in those strikes. He changed speeds on Rose. This time, nothing but fastballs. Fastballs, fastballs. Now, Rose is taking a good look at Grandma's Morgan was turned loose. What do you do in this spot? Would you turn him loose, Joe? I think I would, yes. But I'd make sure he'd pick a pitch because he's got the uh, tying run over there at second base. It depends on him if he doesn't get over anxious. You've got to know your players. Now well, let's see what happens. That's a strike, and Rose taken all the way. He must be nearing the 200 mark and pitch is thrown. He's got to be a tired man, but Joe, you said it so well earlier. What's inside that man? Now we've seen it. We all know what's inside him. One on, one on, three and one on Pete Rose. Geronimo out at second base. Burleson continuing to play games with him. And there's ball four. Dale goes with percentages. He's going with Burton, a youngster. But I'd hate to have. Well, I'd like to have the experience of Tion out there. Talk about things pulling in different directions. Which way is Daryl going to go? Well, Daryl is talking to him, and I'm sure the way he gives him the answers is going to decide that he's going to leave him in. Go with his best, even though he might be tired. Burton and Drago. Drago the right-hander. So the decision has been made by the man who makes him for the Boston Red Sox, Daryl Johnson. Tion will remain in. And the hitter for Cincinnati will be Ken Griffey. Griffey strolls plate where he has had a hit, a double, in the first inning to knock home a run in four times. Got him standing around this ballpark right now. Deion, Ken Griffin, tying run at second. Go ahead, run at first. Ball one. Speed at second, great speed at the plate, and at first base, and Pete Rowe is a guy who can really bust you up if there's a double play attempt. He'll get a good break off the bag as Jastrzemski's not holding him on. We've been on first and second. A big jaw of tobacco in his right jaw. Nods an acknowledgement of the sign from Fisk. important pitch of this game about to be delivered. He loses Griffey. He'll have the bases loaded. The winning run in scoring position and Morgan at the plate.
Boston infield looking for the ground ball. Here comes a 3-1 fifth to Ken Griffith. He bounces first base side, and it's a foul ball. It's Jazz steps across the line to scoop it up. So Geronimo will head on back to second base. Pete Rose takes a slow walk back to first. This crowd really coming to life, and the noise just increasing with the closeness of the pitch. And yet the concentration, I'm sure, of all the ball players out on that field might as well be playing in the middle of a desert. Look at Sparky. Griffey's going to make Dion wait just a moment before moving back into the batter's box. Veteran right-hander has gone as far as he can with Ken Griffey. Three and two the count. The payoff fit. Fly ball hit well to center field. Lynn racing back. He will take the catch. What a catch by Freddie Lynn. Geronimo three quarters of the way down to third. And Fred Lynn has just turned in the defensive play of the game. This is one super pay play by Freddie Lynn under pressure as he just turns his back. He had a long run. He lopes after the ball with that great style and is already familiar, I'm sure, to all of our viewers. He keeps it to the open side. Not once he turned the wrong way and makes a tremendous play under some kind of pressure. And Geronimo at second base, three quarters of the way down, has to go back. But Geronimo, thinking that ball was going to be in there, missed an opportunity to tag and move to third base as the second out is recorded. That's the kind of play you want to tag up on because if it does go over his head, you're going to get third and prot, you're going to score with off the speed, wall. His speed of walk and if here. he's on third, you got some chances with Morgan up, a wild pitch, a ball. A lot of things can happen if you're on third. It's just more pressure for the defense. Here's a man who has not had a good World Series. Joe Morgan, three hits and 13 tries, and he's 0 for 2 tonight, although drove in the winning run last night. He is the last reigning hope for Cincinnati to try and keep the ninth inning going. Deion yeah. delivers. Ronimo at second base, Pete Rose at first. Single and a walk got him there. Freddie Lynn with some kind of play on Ken Griffey. There goes Geronimo, pitch has popped up. And that should do it. Yastrzemski and Boston has taken the fourth game of this World Series. In the ninth inning, the Reds' threat goes by the boards as Louis Tion is mobbed by his teammates. The win tonight ensures that it will go back to Fenway Park as they defeat the Reds 5-4, to four, the third consecutive one-run game. Well, the grittiness of the Red Sox show today hanging tough. Louis Tion, a clutch hit, triple by Evans. A big inning when they scored five in the fourth. But the man again is in game number one, Joe, Al Tionte. That's a big story. He'll get all the headlines, and deservedly so, because extra pressure once again is ball club down by one game. And last night's ball game, controversial play. And Tian comes on, and it looked like he was staggering. And yet when he needed it, he really had it. He needed one good play, Tony and uh, Marty. I felt he, the play by the Lynn on the ball hit by Griffey was the one big play that he needed. And he got it. And the Boston Red Sox make it two games apiece now. And he is really mobbed. There is Tony Conigliaro, now a sports broadcaster, talking to Luis Tian. Well, it's tied up at two. We gave, go to game number five. Bill Lee, the left-hander, he pitched a good second ball game up in Fenway Park, and we'll see Don Gullett, two left-handers. Pete Rose walks, so Ken Griffey comes to the plate with the tying and winning runs on base.
Murphy hits a line drive to center that looks sure to be off the wall. What a catch. Watch it again. Fred Lynn. But Tion still has a problem. Joe Morgan. Geronimo is at second base. Watch him break. Tion throws. Morgan pops it up. It was the 163rd pitch of the game. The Red Sox win what one big league manager used to call a cliff dweller. Boston 5, Cincinnati 4.